this live session. Uh, for the purpose of um, those who may not get one or two things clearly, this is also a recorded session. So I would also advise that after the class, you can take a look again at the video so that um, you don't miss anything. So we shall go right away to the um, lesson of the day. The introductory mathematics for <coughs> economists two. So this is the second um, semester course, of course. At the end of this lesson, students should be able to explore the operational meaning of optimization in economics. You should also be able to analyze the use of constrained optimization in economics. Lastly, you should be able to apply unconstrained optimization. Okay, so having seen uh, the objectives of the Class, we can now um, move on. Now, to optimize means to achieve two conflicting. Things. So, I want to maximize the use of something while minimizing some other factor. So, this would in economics mean an attempt to increase a factor while ensuring all best approaches are um, fully utilized. Now, optimization problems are of two types. We shall be discussing the constrained optimization and the unconstrained optimization. Now, when we say constrained optimization, we are trying to achieve an objective while recognizing the various factors which can hinder achieving the objective. Then for the unconstrained optimization, this entails achieving an objective while following due process in resource allocation. Now, we usually express some concepts as equations and may be interested in finding out if these equations possess the behavioral traits of being maximized or minimized depending on the objective. So what we're saying is that um, there are several concepts in economics. Um, let me give an instance. We have costs, cost as a concept. We have utility as a concept. We have um, revenue as another concept. There are so many of them, profit as a concept. So we might be interested in, if it's an instance of costs, there is no firm that will not be interested in minimizing costs. When it comes to utility as a consumer, you may be interested in maximizing utility. Revenue is something you would want to maximize, so also is profit. Or what if I say loss? Loss is definitely something a firm would want to minimize. So we can express all of these concepts using equations in economics. And then it will be our interest to find out if the behavioral pattern that is expressed in the equation is something that we can maximize or minimize. So there is no sure way of telling when you see an equation that this is a, a minimum function or a maximum function, but there are techniques in mathematics that enables us to uh, ascertain if these functions are minimization or maximization functions. So for unconstrained optimization, we may need to employ what we are going to call the first and second order conditions of optimization. So these are things that are very, very familiar in um, calculus, first and second order conditions of optimization. So let us take a look at what these uh, actually look like. The first order condition to solving a minimization or maximization problem is that the first order derivative of the respective function must be equal to zero. So what we're saying is that, um, let me give an instance. If I say that um, y equals um, 5x raised to the power 3 plus 3x squared, now how do we know if this is a minimum or a maximum function? So what we're saying here is that um, this graph, when we put in values of x and y, or if we put in values of x,
and obtain values of y. And then we plot it a minimum function. Minimum means that look at the lowest point. The lowest point of the graph is where you get the minimum value of the graph. And look at a maximum function. It is an M-shaped graph. So you see the height. At the, the height of the graph is where we get the maximum value of that graph. So X can take any value along the curve, but X to have its highest value at the point where um, Y has its um, the peak. So this is how we know minimum and maximum functions graphically. But if we were not opportune to draw these graphs, how do we know when uh, how do we know when the graphs are minimum or maximum? That is a problem. So that is what this first and second order conditions are meant for. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, class. I will need a moment to um, quickly switch uh, internet source so that we do not have interruptions. So while we wait, it will just be a quick one so that um, we do not have interruptions. Kindly bear with me. We are back. Sorry for the uh, break in transmission. Uh, in employ to serve you all better. So we were talking about looking at this equation. This is a minimum of that the graph look like this. Now that's what we are looking at the first or second order derivative. So the rule here is a function of x meaning that y is the dependent variable and x is an independent variable y with respect to x dy dx this gives us x squared plus 6x let me take us through how i got this the rule of differentiation says that um you take the index and multiply it to the coefficient so 5 times 3 gives us 15. Then from this same index, you subtract one. That gives us three minus two, three minus one, which is two. So if you do the same thing here, two times three, six, then two minus one, which is raised to power one. So this gives us 15x squared plus six x. Now the first order condition says that you take this first order differential and equate it to zero. So it means that we need to solve for this um, quadratic equation to get the value um, the value of x. Now, even after getting the value of x, there's one thing we need to understand. This rule says the first order condition to solving a minimization or maximization problem. So what it means is that the first order condition applies to both the minimum functions and the maximum 
functions. Now, before we go too far, I would want to explain something about um, this first order condition and why it applies to the minimum and maximum function. Now, each time you solve for dy dx, what you are doing is to find the slope of an equation. Let us take something that is a little more, um, that's not so complex. What you are doing is to solve the slope of the equation. So I want to give us a very simple, um, a linear equation so that we could understand better. Now look at this, y equals 5x plus 3. Now we all know that if you express this as y equals a plus bx, a is the intercept of this equation and b is the slope of this equation. So looking at this, it means that 3 here is the intercept and 5 is the slope. So if 5 is the slope, it means that if we differentiate y with respect to x, we should get 5 because this is 5x raised to power 1. 1 times 5 is 5. Then we have 1 minus 1, which gives us x raised to power 0. And anything raised to power 0, according to the law of indices, is equal to 1. So you can see that differential of an equation, you are also looking for the slope of that equation. Now, the slope of a, a, an equation at the minimum or the maximum is always equal to zero. The slope at the minimum or maximum is always equal to zero. Look at this. This is a maximum function. Look at at the top, at the maximum of that graph. Here, if you take the gradient at this maximum, you have that the slope at this gradient is zero. So also, if you take a minimum function and look for the gradient at the very bottom, the gradient or the slope is also equal to zero. So this is why the first order condition applies to both a minimum and a maximum function. And if this is true, it then means that the first order condition is nothing but a necessary condition to finding out if the equation is a minimum or a maximum function. It is just a necessary condition. It is not enough to verify if this equation is a minimum or maximum. And that takes us to the second order differential or derivative or condition rather. So in using the second order differential or condition, excuse me, in using the second order condition, the second order condition now says that if we must identify that a function is a minimum function, then the second order derivative must be greater than zero. If the uh, uh, equation is a minimum. If it's a minimum function, the second order derivative must be greater than zero. And if it is a maximum function, it must be less than zero. So what this means is that, look at the first order condition in, in um, notations, dy dx equals zero. This applies at minimum or maximum. But for the second order condition, we have that d square y, the x squared, is greater than zero, and this is a minimum function. Then d square y, the x squared, is less than zero, and this is a maximum function. So here we have the second order condition, second A and second B, while here we have the first order condition. So the first order condition is that dy dx equals zero, whether at minimum or maximum. It applies to both of them. But for the second order function, it means that at minimum, the second derivative must be greater than zero. At maximum, it must be less than zero. Now, let us make all of this make sense by solving um, a problem. Now, we have that um, the total cost function for a particular firm is expressed as 3x squared minus 12x plus 4. And we're asked to solve for the critical value. The critical value is usually the answer, the value of x that recognizes that this is either a minimum or a maximum function. It is the value of x that places this equation in either a minimum or a maximum function. So what is the value of x? If this were 
if this were to be a minimal function, what is the value of x that will make this be the lowest value of x? Or if this were to be a maximum function, what is the value of x that will make it be a maximum function? How do we get that value? We say using the first order condition. And that says dy dx should be equal to zero. So we differentiate this, we get 6x minus 12. And this equals zero. Okay, so this is what we have here. Now, can we solve for x? 6x equals 12, and x is equal to 12 over 6. This equals 2. So if this is total cost, and this is um, x being the quantities to be produced, it means that if this firm should produce two units of whatever it is they are producing, total cost will be a minimum or maximum because the first order condition does not verify if it is minimum or maximum. So we can now conclude. Now the second part of the question says, conclude if total cost can be minimized at the critical value. The only way we can find out if it can be minimized is to apply the second order condition. And what does the second order condition say? D square y, the x squared. Meaning that d square y, the x squared means you need to differentiate the differential. We have differentiated dy dx the first time. So we need to differentiate that dy dx a second time. And that will give us the second order condition. So all we need to do is to take this differential here, this first order, and differentiate it the second time. So if we differentiate 6x, we are going to get equals 6. Is 6 greater than 0 or less than 0? 6 is greater than 0. And any time the second order is greater than zero, meaning it is positive, it means that the original function is a minimum function. The original function is a minimum function. So yes, we can conclude that if this firm should produce only two units of their products, their total cost will be minimized. So you see, this is how firms apply mathematics to solve optimization problems. We want to produce, and every firm knows that when you produce more, you get more revenue. But the problem now is there is an extent to which you produce and your total cost becomes unbearable. So how can we minimize our total costs? What is the quantity we need to produce beyond which our total cost will not be so much? You know, And that's what um, all of this is all about. So you need the first order condition and the second order condition to be able to ascertain this. Now look at the graph. I took the liberty of drawing the graph of this equation, tx, sorry, tc equals 3x squared minus 12x plus 4. And look at the graph. Look at our x-axis. If you look at this, this graph clearly shows that you can only get a minimum value, and that minimum value is found at the lowest point of the graph. And guess what? What is the value of x at the lowest point of the graph? If you trace it up, you can see it gives us 2. At the lowest point of the graph, x is equal to 2. So solving it by graph or solving it mathematically, it gives us the same answer. Now, there is something else I want to explain to us about um, economic literature before we move on. Anytime you differentiate the total cost function with respect to quantity, what you are getting is the marginal cost. So marginal cost, MC, is equal to the change in, in what? Total cost with respect to change in quantity. That's what we define. That the marginal cost of production is the extra cost that is derived from producing an extra unit of the commodity. So if you differentiate total cost with respect to quantity, what you have gotten is what? Marginal cost. So you can now see that MC is the same thing as dy dx. So it makes sense why um, we apply calculus in economics. So we can move on to something else. So in summary, this is wrongly placed. In summary, the unconstrained optimization problems are used to solve, achieve, or to achieve objective functions under careful consideration of resource allocation. Then it utilizes two major conditions 
One is the necessary condition, which we just talked about, and that is that the first order derivative equals zero. And the second order condition is also referred to as the sufficient condition. It is the one that um, helps us verify. And it says that if it is a maximum function, the second order derivative must be negative. And if it's a minimum function, it must be positive. Positive means greater than zero. Negative means less than zero. Okay. Now, to optimize means either to maximize or minimize, but under careful consideration of resource allocation. In terms of constraint optimization, it means to achieve an objective of minimizing resources without hurting the maximization of benefits. Now, this is why it is very, very, very fallacious to say that economists are always economizing, because to economize means just to reduce the, the loss, to reduce the cost without paying attention to the benefits. So economists do not economize. You know, the, the, word, the correct word is economists optimize, because while you are trying to bring down your costs, you are also trying to increase your output. While you are trying to increase your utility, you are trying to reduce your expenditure. So anybody who is trying to reduce his expenditure, but is not bothered if his satisfaction is increasing, the person is economizing. But if you are trying to minimize expenses, but you are bothered, you don't want to minimize expense beyond the point where your utility cannot be increased anymore, then you say you are optimizing. Okay, so having said all of this, we can move on to um, the next topic, which is multivariable functions and partial derivatives. Okay, so we shall uh, take a while to study further um, optimization problems. Now, this aspect of differential calculus can be used in application of solving constrained optimization problems. We first need to understand that in real life scenarios, a variable cannot be determined by only one variable. It is not possible. It cannot be determined by only one variable. It would be determined by multiple variables. If this is true, to find the rate of change in a variable at ceteris paribus condition would be a partial differential. Now, I'll take it one at a time. Now, you're attending this lecture is a dependent variable and it depends on so many factors the the, the the chief factor that will determine if you would attend my lecture today or not is if you have time so that is the chief factor but even if you have time there are many other factors that may make it impossible for you to attend one of them could be if you are sick another could be if you have internet problems some other could be if you are caught in traffic you know so we see that there are so many factors and that is why we are saying that in real life scenarios, it is not possible that only one variable determines a dependent variable. Now, if it is true that several variables can determine the dependent variable, then we need to, for us to study the influence of each of these variables and their contribution to the changes in the dependent variable, we need to study them at a ceteris paribus condition. Ceteris paribus is something we always say in economics but it, in, it means all things being equal. We already know that. Well, how do we apply ceteris paribus when solving um, or making economic analysis? It means that we are trying to ignore the existence of other variables or the contributions of other variables while we are focusing our attention on the variable of interest. So that is what it means anytime we are conducting a partial differential. Now, this is because, as we explained, that um, since many variables contribute to the changes in the dependent variable, it is only logical that only one variable cannot be entirely responsible for the changes in the dependent variable. To this end, we can only study the contribution of that variable in a controlled environment. Now, let me give an analogy. Imagine there are three of us in a room and a fourth person walks in. If all three of us have sprayed very good deodorants and the fourth person may recognize one out of all four scents, to know which individual has the scent, he would have to smell us in isolation of the other. So he smells Mr. A and uh, no, you are not the one who, is, uh, who has sprayed the deodorant I'm perceiving. 
and then he does the same for Mr. B and C. But you see that um, when everybody's in the room, it may be difficult for him to find out which particular person has that silage. But if he observes each individual independently, you know, individually in isolation on the certain risk-parable condition, he may be able to find out which particular person is making that contribution. That is what partial differential is all about. We know that every variable is making a contribution, but we want to know what is the extent of contribution each variable makes. And for us to do that, we need to assume that every other variable is a constant. Every other variable does not make a change. Okay, now let us take a look at this. This is what happens in partial differential. Now, if we have a function as this, z is a function of x and y, and is defined as 4x squared y cubed plus 3x minus 5y cubed plus 12. We can find the partial derivative of z with respect to any of x and y, meaning that z can change if x changes or if y changes or if both of them changes together. So let us solve for this. If we differentiate z with respect to x, we can call it z subscript x. And let us differentiate that. So remember, set is variables means we are going to treat, we are going to ignore other variables. We are going to ignore them. But look at what we're going to do here. X and Y are interactive. So uh, X is a husband and Y is a wife. When you are differentiating interacted uh, variables as this, you do not ignore the other. The, the, the Y variable is going to appear from in the differential. But if you are going to uh, differentiate Y variable, sorry, X, any Y variable standing alone will be treated as a constant. So let us um, practicalize this. Differentiating Z with respect to X, two times four gives us eight. Then we subtract one from two and that gives us eight X. But then the husband will not leave the wife, right? We said that before. So we have Y raised to power three. This is because X and Y are already in a relationship. They are already interactive. Now, the next term has an X. We can differentiate. If we differentiate three X, we would have just three. But then look at Y. Y is standing alone. If we differentiate here, we cannot find X here. So it means that X cannot make a contribution where it does not exist. So the differential here is zero. This is plus zero. And then this is also another constant. The differential of a constant with respect to a variable is also zero. So from what we have here, our differential, our partial differential of um, Z with respect to X is 8XY cubed plus three. Now let us now differentiate um, Z again with respect to Y this time. Now the same rule applies. X and Y are in a union. So we're not going to throw X away, but then the Index of y is 3. It will multiply the coefficient 4. So 3 times 4 gives us 12. Of course, x remains as it is, but then y, we have here 3 raised to the power 3 minus 1, which gives us 2. Then this x will be treated, because it exists alone, it will be treated as a constant. So this gives us 0. And then we have here minus 15x squared. And this 12 also is a constant, so it becomes zero. Now, let us now take the total difference, differential of Z. Total differential of Z is expressed as delta Z delta X D X plus delta Z delta Y D Y. So what is delta Z delta X? That is equal to eight X Y cubed plus three. All of this dx plus delta z delta y, which is 12x squared y squared minus 15x squared, all of this delta y. So this is the final answer for dz. So it is just as simple as this. This is what we call the partial differential with respect to x. This is partial differential with respect to y. And this one is called the total differential when there are multiple variables. Okay, so we can move on to the next um, thing. Now, I'm going to consider this same function, but
But this time around, we'll be looking at how to get what we call the cross partials. Now, I am teaching you cross partials because before we can talk about second order differentials, we need to differentiate two times. And if you differentiate this equation, with you can differentiate, recall from what we did here, we can differentiate z with respect to x, we can differentiate z with respect to y. I also need you to understand that the second order differential, you can still differentiate it with respect to x and y. For this one, this second one, you can also differentiate it with respect to x and y. So these are what we call the um, cross partials. So to get the cross partials, let us now differentiate. The cross partial, the first cross partial means we have already differentiated z with respect to x, and we're differentiating that differential a second time with respect to x again. So this is now written as zxx. Some textbooks can write it as delta squared z delta x squared. Whether this or this or this, we're saying the same thing. So to differentiate that, now let us recall uh, delta z delta x gave us um, 8xyq uh, plus 3. This is what we got. So this is what we want to differentiate again with respect to x. So the index here is 1. 1 times 8 gives us 8. Then x turns to 0. We're having y, q. This one is a constant. It disappears. So we're done with this. Okay. Then let us now look at this cross partial. This is delta z, delta x with respect to y. Delta z, delta x with respect to y. Meaning that this same function, which we just differentiated with respect to x, let us now differentiate it again with respect to y. So this will give us equal to 24x y squared. Then can we now have, can we have delta z delta y, the differential of this with respect to y. So let us recall that when we differentiated this original function with respect to y, we had delta z delta y equals um, 12x squared y squared minus 15y squared. This is what we had. So we're going to differentiate this with respect to y. And that will give us this 2 here. y is raised to power 2. The index of 2 multiplying 12 gives us what? 24x squared. Then y gives us what? y minus. This gives us 30y. Then we can also differentiate delta, delta z, delta x, delta x. This gives us z, y, x. Okay? And then this is equal to, meaning we are going to differentiate this first order differential with respect to x. And that gives us 24x y squared. All of this turns to zero. And then I have a statement here. Can you notice that the cross partials are equal? What do you mean by the cross partials? z, x, y is the same thing as z, y, x. And that equals to what? 24xy squared. So look at it here. This is exactly this. They are cross partials. So cross partials means here we have a function that was originally differentiated with respect to x and later differentiated again a second time with respect to y. And this other one means an original function which was first differentiated with respect to y and differentiated a second time with respect to x. So whether you differentiate with respect to x and later y, or y and later x, you will get the same answer because they are cross partials. Okay, so moving on, we can now, um, okay, sorry, I had the provision for that written here. Yeah, so we can now go on to um, solving constraint optimization problems. Now that we have an idea of how to solve cross partials, you know, so if you want to apply the first order and second order conditions, we now know what to look out for. So let us now look at um, this equation. Consider this equation, which is a utility function, that the utility of a consumer is expressed as a function of x and y, which equals x times y. And then the price of good x and price of good y are two naira each. If the consumer has an income of 60 naira, what quantity of goods can he consume to maximize his utility? So we must first understand that our objective function 
is to maximize utility. That is what this consumer is interested in. He wishes to maximize utility, which is equal to X times Y. But he is constrained by his income. He's constrained by his expenditure. So we said the price of good X is two Naira. So two Naira times the quantity of X plus two Naira times quantity of Y equals his income or originally should be less than or equal to his income. What this means is that whatever quantity of X this guy wants to buy times the price gives you the total expenditure on X. Whatever quantity of Y he wishes to buy times the price gives you the total expenditure on Y. So total expenditure on X plus total expenditure on Y should give you either less than the income or equal to the income. If it is less than the income, it means that this guy is not spending all his money. If it is equal to his income, it means he is spending all his money. So whichever way, this is what is constraining him. If you leave this guy alone, he would consume X and Y as much as he wants. Remember, part of the um, axioms of consumer preferences is that consumers prefer more to less. Everybody wants more. Do you want one car or two cars? I want two cars. Do you want two cars or three cars? I want three cars. You see, so each time you are given an option of more, you always want to take the more. But then, can you? how many cars can you afford? Uh, I can afford only one. So you now see that you are constrained by your income. So this means that um, we want to maximize utility subject to our constraints of this, subject to our income constraints, 2x plus 2y less than or equal to 60. Now, the next thing we are going to do is to set up the Lagrangian. So we are actually solving a constraint optimization using the Lagrangian multiplier approach. The Lagrangian multiplier approach. So we set up the Lagrangian, which equals um, x, y plus lambda, we have lambda here represents the Lagrangian multiplier itself times 2x. Okay, let me rewrite this. I want to do some minor transformation. So the lambda times 60 minus 2x minus 2y. So all I have done is if you look at our constraint, I have taken 2x plus 2y to the other side of the inequality. So that on this side, we are left with zero and we have 60 minus 2x minus 2y. Now that we have our Lagrangian equation, we are going to differentiate this Lagrangian equation with respect to three variables. The first variable is with respect to x, the second variable is with respect to y, and the third variable is with respect to lambda. So this is what we're, that's all we're going to do, and then we simplify from there. So differentiating partially the Lagrangian with respect to x gives us here x, becomes one, one times y gives us y plus lambda. Here we have a constant zero. Here we have minus two and y turns to zero. So this is equal to equal to zero. And why are we equating to zero? Because the first order condition says whether at minimum or maximum, you should equate the first differential to zero. So we can call this equation one and this gives us that um, y minus 2 lambda equals 0. So that um, lambda, sorry, uh, let us see how do we simplify this in a way it doesn't make us spend so much time. Okay, so um, y minus y over 2 equals lambda. Let me do it as this. And this is our equation 2. Okay, so if we simplify, sorry, this is not minus y over two, this is plus y over two. So if we simplify further, lambda will give us y over two. So now that we have this, we can now differentiate again this same Lagrangian equation, this time around with respect to x. And this gives us, sorry, with respect to y this time around. And this gives us x plus lambda, here we have minus 2 again because from here we get minus 2 and this is equal to 0 so that x minus 2 lambda equals 0 and um, we end up having x over 
two equals lambda. And uh, this is equation, let's call this equation three. Then the third one, we differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to lambda, and it gives us lambda here turns to one, and it gives us 60 minus 2x minus 2y equals zero. So that we end up having back our equation, 2x plus 2y equals 60. Equation four. Okay, so we end up having here equals 60. So these are equation four. Now we look at equation two. Equation two equals lambda. Lambda is defined as y over two. And look at equation three. Lambda again is defined as x over two. So if equation two is equal to lambda and equation three is also equal to lambda, all we need to do is to equate both uh, lambdas together so that we can equate equation two, equate equation two to three. So we have that, um, what is equation two? Equation two says y over two equals lambda. So y over two equals x over two. If we multiply both sides by two, you have that y is equal to x. Are we together? Y equals um, x from what we have here. Okay. Now that we have that y is equal to x, have we actually solved for y? No. Have we solved for x? No. So we, what we have arrived at is that one variable that we don't know the answer is equal to another variable that we don't know the answer. So what we can do is to pick this thing we have got here and fix it into equation three. And what does equation, sorry, not equation three, let's um, take the equation four rather. Equation four, and that says two X, okay, let me make a statement for easy reference. Put the above, into equation four and equation four says 2x plus 2y equals 60. so if y and x are the same there is no need rewriting them anywhere we see y we can just write x or anywhere we see x we can just write y so let me remove this x and replace it with y this gives us 2y plus 2y equal 60. so that this gives us 4y equals 60 and y equals 60 over 4 and i want to believe that is um 15, right? Yeah, so that's equal to 15. So if y is equal to 15, what is x? Remember, this guy here says x and y are the same. So if y equals 15, y x is also equal to 15. So what we are simply saying here in conclusion is that if this consumer wishes to maximize his um, utility, he wants to get utility to the highest satisfaction. He needs to buy 15 units of X and 15 units of Y. So X could be granuts and Y could be bananas, you know? So he needs to buy 15 units of each if he is going to get to his highest satisfaction. But this is based on what? His income, the income he has. Now let us check out the income. 60 he has 16 error if he buys 15 units of x and 15 units of y will we give us 60 let's find out x is 2 naira y is 2 naira so this plus this is what 30 this plus this is also 30 so 60 equals 60 the left hand side equals the right hand side so you can see that one thing the theory of utility based on this constraint optimization is telling us is that if you are going to maximize utility and get to the highest satisfaction, you need to spend all of your income. So the next time someone tells you economists are stingy, remind them that economic literature explains that you need to spend all your income for you to get to the highest satisfaction. So this is just what we have solved here mathematically, that this guy is going to spend all of his income. Look at his expenditure on X, expenditure on X here. Look at the expenditure on Y here. 
at the end of the day, his total expenditure is equal to his income. So, and that is because he is trying to consume the quantities that will maximize his utility. So, you can see that constrained optimization is a little more different from unconstrained optimization. Because in unconstrained optimization, we are only looking at resource allocation, efficient resource allocation. But in constrained optimization, while we are looking at resource allocation, we are also considering what are those things that can hinder us from achieving our objective. Now, the Lagrangian multiplier approach helps us to solve um, optimization problems that has just one constraint. What if there are many other constraints? Because, of course, in real life, there are always going to be many constraints. You want to increase your satisfaction, but then you are constrained by your income. That is basic. Are there other things that can keep you from increasing your satisfaction? The answer is yes, your health. Somebody is hungry for something, but he can't taste it because he's sick. You know, there are many other factors. The availability of the commodity, the tax on that commodity is so high. I want to use an iPhone 12, but then Nigerian government says everybody who owns iPhone 12 will pay this amount. So you can now see that um, there are so many factors that can um, uh, hinder your objective function. Now, uh, is there a technique that can allow us to solve optimization problems when we have multiple constraints? The answer is yes. And um, one of such techniques is the linear programming approach. The linear programming. This helps us solve optimization problems when we have so many um, constraints. But this topic is beyond the scope of this class. And uh, I just want to mention it to your hearing. But we shall, in future classes, take um, you know, uh, lessons on how to solve linear programming problem, not in, the, in this year, in your, in your um, subsequent years of study in the discipline. So we shall also look at more advanced approaches of um, solving optimization problems with uh, multiple constraints. Now, I know that um, you guys are already having multiple questions. Some of you probably don't even understand all the magic I've done here. Or there is one. There are one or two things that um, probably you skipped um, hearing. Yeah, we would have time to attend to those things. So I would just want to take us through the summary of this class. So far, so good. What and what have we studied before the time is out? Okay. So in summary. Differential calculus is an important tool in solving optimization problems, problems that concerns uh, rates of change. Economists are very interested in finding effects of changes on variables, and as such, these things are taken into consideration. Now, recall that in solving optimization problems, we are interested in finding out if the optimization problems are verified. And then there is a high need to merge mathematical indices with economic literature. For instance, the first order derivative is usually the slope of an equation. And in economics, this implies the marginal function. Now, let me take you back to your principles of economics class, Echo 101. One of the principles of economics says what? That rational people think at the margin. Now, if you are rational, it means that you are always interested in what is the extra. If I take this line of action, what is the extra? I am doing something consistently. If I do it one more time, what will be the outcome of that extra I have done? So that's what we're looking at. That's what we mean by um, uh, thinking at the margin. So anytime you differentiate a function, we've said this before, you obtain the marginal function. Now, a benchmark for growth of any total concept in economics is when the marginal function equals zero. So for you to say that um, now we're trying to apply some economic literature to all the mathematical jargon we've been doing so far, that if, now let me make that statement again, a benchmark for growth of any total concept in economics is when the marginal function equals zero. I'll give you an instance. Look at total products. The graph of total product is like this. This is total product. It keeps increasing. Now look at this point. At the maximum here, at that maximum, 
the marginal product function gets to zero. So the point when total product is at its highest, marginal product is equal to zero. This is the same thing that applies to total utility and marginal utility. So total utility is explaining your level of satisfaction. Each time you consume a commodity, you keep getting satisfied. Now, what about marginal utility? What does it measure? It measures your ability to keep taking more. Your ability to keep taking more. So you see that practically, as your level of satisfaction increases, your ability to take more reduces. By the time you would have gotten to your highest of satisfaction, your ability to take more gets to where? Zero. So this is just a theoretical explanation to all the graphs we are drawing. So that this also explains why we always say, let the first order differential be equal to zero. Because in real life sense, the first order differential is the marginal function. And the marginal function will always be zero when the total function is at its highest or when the total function is at its lowest in terms of total cost and um, total loss, for instance. So you can also understand that um, marginal function for total product or total utility, why is it reducing? This is also explained in the law of diminishing marginal returns and also the law of diminishing marginal utility. So all of these things we are learning, they are all you know, summed up in uh, economic um, literature. So I would open up the polls. You are expected at the end of every live lesson to take the polls. Um, the polls is to help us understand what problems you may have had while we were taking this um, lesson. So please take the polls while you can also ask questions. If you have a question, um, kindly ask your question. We have about six minutes before the end of this lesson. So while others are asking their questions, I need the rest of you to take the poll. Let us know your concerns. Please ask your question, feel free to ask your question. There will also be provision for office hours if we cannot sort out whatever problem you may have. You can also make use of the office hours. So please, two things are concurrently going on. Ask your questions if you have a question and then take the polls. The poll has been launched, take the polls. We would like to get feedback from you so that we can know how to improve services. Okay, we have other students. AGK, have you taken the poll? Maureen, have you taken the poll? Taiwo, have you taken the poll? Toluani, have you also taken the poll? I guess this is all of you uh, on the session today. Please confirm with a thumbs up if you do not have a question. Confirm with a thumbs up if you do not have a question. Okay, Maureen doesn't have a question. Okay, Tuluani also has responded. Tairu is AGK with us. Okay, once again, confirm with a thumbs up if you have taken the poll. Okay, Maureen has taken the poll. Please, who else has taken the poll? We would need you to confirm if you have taken the poll so that um, if you're having problems, we may know how to um, help you solve problems. So no one can't see the poll. There is a place for activities. If you're using your phone or your system, if it's your laptop, look for the, um, there are three symbols, a triangle, a square, and a circle. You click on that symbol, then you can see where to take the poll from. So have you seen it now, Toluani?
Yes, please, you can unmute. Tuluani, yes, you can. Oh, sorry about that. Did I? Okay, sorry about that, please. Yes, you can unmute. Okay. Um. So what I have is like I have modules, live lessons, assignments, discussions, grades, people, pages, files, syllabus, quizzes, collaborations, and search. I don't have a section oh. for. Okay, the, the, the poll should be on this call. Oh, it I see. Be, yeah, it should be on this call, not on the LMS. Okay, so on that, yeah, okay, I see now. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no questions, um, it has been a very, very wonderful time with you guys. I um, really enjoyed having you guys here. I want to believe that um, I may not have solved all your problems, but um, maybe along your reading, you find something exciting. Uh, feel free to send a message and um, please make use of the office hours. We can always take more of these sessions, even at the office hours. Just come with your problem. If we can't solve them, then of course we can always rebook. I'll be glad to hear from you again. And until then, bye for now. Thank you, sir. You're well done, sir. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, sir. You have a great day. I wish you the same.